Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Chris Jones. Chris Jones leads the River and Beaver Restoration Program for Beaver Trust, helping communities to develop projects that will recover biodiversity and build climate resilience. He's a farmer and ecologist based in mid-Cornwall. He's worked as a policeman in Africa, as a forester in southwest England, as a drilling fluids engineer in the North Sea, Middle East, and Africa, and as a theme running throughout as a farmer in Cornwall. He's been interested in the idea of reintroducing beavers to the U.K. for many years, and has been practically involved setting up and running the Cornwall Beaver Project with Cornwall Wildlife Trust and Exeter University since 2014. So first off, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program. Oh, you're really welcome, Derek. So can you, you know, when I wrote to you about this interview, I said, can we start talking about, can we start by talking about what Britain was like a long time ago ecologically? But maybe if that's too much, can we focus on Cornwall? So can you either talk about what Britain was like ecologically um, a long time ago or or Cornwall specifically? I, I think it would be maybe easier to talk about Britain as a whole, really, um, before getting to Cornwall. And, and um, you know, Britain was quite literally connected to Europe, the continent of Europe, up until about 8,000 years ago, um, uh, when the uh, melting of the, um, the the glaciers from the last ice age uh, really, really got underway. And in fact, there's a catastrophic, catastrophic event uh, sometime around 8,000 years ago where an mm-hmm. immense tidal mm-hmm. wave, which resulted from the collapse of a, an ice sheet uh, in, in uh, Norway, uh, found out over um, uh, the, the land which was become the North Sea and and whatever the, the current coast of our eastern sort of seaboard looks like. And um, and I guess uh, we had a very small human population about then. And in fact, I think a lot of the humans were wiped out because uh, a, a lot of them were. Uh, in that area of fairly low-lying grassland um, and river delta, which was uh, now, which is now the North Sea, and um, up until that point, we we had a, a fauna which was pretty much like the rest of Europe, uh, i.e., and I, I guess much like um, uh, the, uh, the the fauna of North America, with very large herbivores, pretty large carnivores, um, big herds of uh, ruminants walking around, big herds of um, uh, mammoths and mastodons walking around, and a, a very different sort of picture to, to that we have now. Um, and I guess once we became an island, the destruction of those animals by the people here was was really quite uh, assured. Uh, extinctions happen on islands really, really fast. Um, and uh, there were enough people here to bring that about. And indeed, by the time we got into the New Stone Age, uh, five, four or five thousand years ago, uh, we were into farming in this country. And um, uh, the uh, the wilderness, if you like, had pretty much all gone. And it's been a story since then um, uh, for the subsequent uh, thousands of years, uh, a, a gradual erosion of the, the natural base. Um, so that, you know, we have national parks here, but the national parks we have aren't national parks because they have herds of bison running around still and, and that kind of thing. They're, they're national parks because they look pretty. Um, our, uh, our biodiversity and, and, and our wild biomass has been absolutely hammered by um, human occupation. And I guess maybe in common with the U.S., um, and certainly in common with with, uh, with the rest of Europe, this has become really incredibly accelerated in the last uh, 60 or 70 years with the Green Revolution, uh, because the Green Revolution didn't just uh, guarantee uh, no more hunger. It guaranteed through the methods using that we were going to kill every damn thing out there pretty much, unless it was very lucky. Um, so, you know, we have gone from a situation of extreme abundance through um, uh, the, the typical run of, of um, uh, human development um, uh, and particularly unenlightened human development 
until we've got to now where there is very, very little left of anything which is very exciting uh, biologically. So before, thank you for that. And before we move on, um, was, if we go back, say, a um, 1,000 years or, or 600 years, was, or, or go yep. back further, you, you mentioned grasslands earlier with what is now under the North Sea. Was much of uh, the, was much of Britain, and I know, again, it's a big area, so there's going to be a lot of variation, but was much of it forested or was it much of it grassland? Was much of it sort of marshy? Uh, was much of it, you know, six, six inches above a river and so routinely flooded? Um, what what was were there were there big that, that's a that's a, a a a really good question, and I think that the, the real answer is we don't actually know because it was all prehistoric, but um, I think we are gradually getting more of an understanding now that uh, uh, what we think of as as natural forest, the closed canopy, is maybe not that natural because when we when we add uh, megafauna to it when we ha add elephants to it and large herds of ruminants which are going to re really um, um, uh, uh, make it hard for, for recruitment of new trees to, a, to, to, to an ecosystem I think what we'll have is, is a much more uh, open landscape with trees probably with a lot of trees still but they're going to be much more scattered than, than perhaps we think or, or much more uh, clumped, if we if we think of those in those terms, and, and I imagine that something pretty similar uh, happened in in the U.S. I mean, could could the could the Great Appalachian Forest have been Great Appalachian Forest in the presence of of mastodons? But of course, we know in in the U.S. they were wiped out uh, uh, pretty soon after human humans arrived there, uh, and then once once that once you don't have that um, uh, that biological um, a means of smashing great holes in, in, in a canopy, which you get when you've got elephants, then um, everything starts to change. So thank you for that. Can, can we move to Cornwall? What was Cornwall? Can you give a brief history, ecological history of Cornwall? Yeah, uh, um, okay. Cornwall um, always was a bit of a peninsula um, and uh, it was quite densely populated with people over the last few thousand years. This is all relative, of course. Um, uh, and I, I sense that the uh, wildlife here probably got hammered uh, uh, further and faster in, in, in a peninsula. Um, you know, p peninsulas uh, are great places for extinctions to happen quickly, uh, as are islands, of course, um, uh, because you don't have the chart. It's, it's much harder if you're nearly surrounded by water, to recruit new new, uh, new members of a species to the place. So I, I reckon any megafauna that was here was was uh, was gone fairly early on. And and certainly one of the symptoms of that, if you like, is is a situation with deer in the country. Now, deer, deer are our only uh, native uh, land uh, megafauna that's left. There's, there's nothing else really. Um, and deer, as when I was a child, deer were only present here uh, in captive populations. But now, through a whole host of reasons, they're actually beginning to uh, really come back. Um, and there are parts of the county where now you find it quite hard to plant a tree and expect it to grow in a field unless you protected it from deer. We're not quite like that here, but um, certainly through the last 30 years, uh, I, I've been able to say yes. I can regularly see see deer on my property, which which uh, for the first thirty years of my life was you know unheard of. So let's um, let's start moving toward toward your work and beavers. And can you can you give us a brief history of of beavers in Britain? Well, uh, um, beavers really very much the same as the, as the states. Even though they're different species, they, they seem to behave in exactly the same manner and have the same mm -hmm. uh, kind of social structure uh, and uh, and so on. So so um, we imagine that prior to humanity really getting a grip of Europe, um, 
that the concentration of these animals would have been somewhat similar to North America. And these animals, this, this species ranged from the far west of Great Britain right across to Siberia, uh, from the Arctic Circle down to the Mediterranean, down into uh, the Holy Land and the Middle East, and down into I Iraq and Syria, uh, through Iran, um, down across the stands into uh, uh, Central Asia, if you like, through to Mongolia and northern China. And you know, an, an immense landmass, a landmass to actually make the USA look quite small, I guess. And, um, you know, the, we estimate and we know much more about a, a, a North American beavers because they were still there when people who could read and write got there and started harvesting them. So we know a lot about that. And, and, and there's, the estimate is around 200 million plus some might even say 400 million beavers in, in North America when uh, um, the Pilgrim Fathers landed. Uh, and we can see no reason why uh, five or 6,000 years ago there were not a similar number in Europe. We think that uh, European societies used beavers a lot more, uh, um, consumed beavers a lot more than uh, perhaps the uh, uh, Native Americans, but... Um, you know, it, it, would, it wouldn't have been an industrial use for some time, but eventually I think they, they started to be really, really uh, used up. And looking at Cornwall in particular, or, or, or Britain, um, we have records of, of beavers uh, up till about 400 years ago, but they become quite scarce, uh, those records. If we go back to uh, the period of around about um, eight or 900 uh, A.D., uh, Cornwall became suddenly very, very, very uh, um, heavily populated then because a certain King Athelstan, who was an Anglo-Saxon, he ethnically, ethnically cleansed uh, the Cornish out of the counties of uh, Devon, Somerset and Dorset and pushed them all back to the west across the border into, uh, in, into Cornwall. And I suspect if there were any beavers left there then, they would have been gone in a very short space of time because, as we all know, beavers are not hard to catch. They're good to eat. Mm -hmm. They have a very useful skin as well. So I just don't think they would have lasted very long, frankly, uh, when that um, when that happened. Uh, and the only the only physical or archaeological evidence we have of beavers here is actually from an Iron Age location. Um, around about uh, 1500 years old in in, uh, in North Cornwall. Um, there are lots of lots of uh, uh, archaeological records elsewhere and indeed written records elsewhere uh, in in the country but uh, Cornwall I think would they would have disappeared quite a long time ago. And can you talk a little bit about the uh, ecological role and ecological importance of beavers? Um, they seem like, uh, frankly, miracle workers when it comes to uh, increasing biodiversity. Uh, there is absolutely no question about that. And I, I almost don't know where to begin uh, on this story. Um, there are some wonderful uh, American uh, authors on this and, and, and American um, uh, beaver believers, if you like, who I have learned an enormous amount from because, you know, the, the, the uh, American uh, beaver and uh, the uh, European beaver, they are absolute analogues of each other. So so there's much, much to learn from America. But um, um, an insight which I had uh, about 18 months after we started having beavers on our own property here was that the, the beavers, they they – they turn our ideas of hydrology on their head. Certainly in, in uh, this country, we are all taught uh, from a very early age that rivers start very, very small and they flow down to the sea, uh, tinkling romantically over gravel and stones uh, at, a, at a generally pretty fast rate until they hit the sea. 
and and then uh, that's that. And the rivers get bigger as you go along and slower uh, and so on. Now, uh, what beavers do when they uh, arrive in a catchment, as as they uh, head up further and further towards the headwaters, they begin to build dams. And this is where the magic begins. You know, if the river's big enough, they won't build any dams. Why would they? Uh, they're very much like us. They don't want to do work. They don't have to. So if they've got water, which is, let's say, two or three feet deep, they won't be building any dams. Uh, but once once it starts to get shallower and the streams get narrower, then they will have to build dams in order to get that uh, depth of water that they, they want. Now, if you imagine uh, going up in the headwaters where you've got a, a very rapidly flowing stream, it can be carrying all sorts of nutrients with it. Um, it can it can hold a certain amount of life, but once the beaver dams uh, uh, start to uh, appear, the water obviously has to slow down, and you get a large volume of water in in a particular point in the landscape with each dam. And uh, uh, although visually it doesn't look like a, a big mature river, it's beginning to take on some of those characteristics. Either water becomes slow moving. And once it becomes slow moving, it's going to have a certain amount of nutrient in it. Once it becomes slow moving, algae can begin to develop. And algae is the absolute basis of all aquatic food chains. It's the first thing you get, single celled plants. And once you get single celled plants uh, appearing in, in quantity, then a whole heap of other stuff can come along with it. Uh, which is going to consume that. Uh, and you, you get this incredibly rich web of of, uh, uh, of life uh, building up in these ponds. And these ponds, they are linked to each other as you head up through a catchment. You know, the, the beavers, they don't want to walk anywhere. They want to swim everywhere. So, so their dams will be at a distance apart, uh, depending on the gradient, uh, a, a, a shallower gradient. They'll be further apart because the water can back up more. A steeper gradient where the water can't back up so far, there'll be more frequent dams. But you'll, you'll end up with a, a situation if the if the uh, um, ecosystem is, is is fully occupied by beavers, there'll be dam after dam after dam after dam, each of which is a rich soup of uh, algae and uh, single celled creatures and little invertebrates and bigger invertebrates and bigger invertebrates, and then um, all, all your uh, various vertebrate um, uh, orders as well, like um, your amphibians and your fish and, and so on. And this has got huge significance for a whole whole range of things um, which are, are generally speaking in, in trouble. And we've noticed here, uh, since our, uh, uh, our beaver uh, ponds have been um, started, we have acquired eight new bird records on the site and three new mammal records. Um, and um, we know we've got a lot of invertebrates. We, we have not had the, uh, the, the, the input, if you like, to be able to identify uh, everything or even establish baselines for what they are, but we just noticed there is a lot more. That, but what we have noticed Certainly is the is the uh, uh, the, the vertebrate stuff, um, and I guess that's quite common wherever you go. Is, is people notice the vertebrates because they're bigger and, and more interesting. Um, and um, um, I was going to say the the, the uh, one of the expressions of this of this um, uh, uptick in, in uh, biodiversity and critically bioabundance is things like bats, I and mean, we have. Tremendous uh, uh, populations of bats foraging here uh, during the warmer months of the year, um, and including some really rare, rare ones. And we, we, we our, our assumption is that as we as we get more and more of our headwaters uh, nationally occupied by beavers, which we hope is going to happen, um, there will be more and more space for these creatures to to uh, uh, to be um, uh, foraging. And of course. Everything about biology is really about the transfer of energy, isn't it? And, and if we're capturing a lot of extra energy in the water through algae uh, harvesting sunshine, then everything else is bound to come with it. Um, 
and, and I'm not saying, we're, you know, we're not going to get uh, uh, elephants coming back necessarily, but uh, or, or, or lions and tigers. But what we are seeing is certainly in, in, in the gilded creatures which are available uh, uh, to come back, they are coming back such that uh, a particular bird called the willow tit, which is um, the fastest, fastest declining woodland bird in, in Britain today, for which there is no recovery plan. We have uh, had a pair nest and raise a family uh, in our beaver sites uh, last year. And touch wood, we have seen it several times this winter, these animals several times this winter, uh, and we are hoping very strongly that they will remain here and, and breed more. And it's just because the, the beaver creates that complexity uh, and, and critically abundance of life that uh, um, the, 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 uh, the, the willow tits can take advantage of. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, um, I wish sometimes we could actually remove the word uh, beaver completely, redact the word altogether from our talks around this, because the, the fundamental thing isn't the animals themselves, although they're fascinating and do amazing things. It's everything else that comes with it. That, that in a way, that's the really important thing. Well, um, I'll probably say it. I'm sorry, what? I, I said I, th I think I've probably said enough. No, it's great. <laughs> People might think a, a beaver fan. <laughs> no, this is this is fabulous. Um, thank you so much. And this is a shot in the dark. But do you also see um a lot more dragonflies because of this? Uh, there is no doubt we have a lot of dragonflies here now, uh, and we had uh on our ponds. And remember, remember, my beaver site is a postage stamp. It's only it's only two hundred meters long. Uh, and it's only five acres altogether. But we have, um, uh, I think, 14 species recorded here now, uh, whereas typically we would have seen maybe half a dozen if we were lucky before. So so the dragonflies are increasing, um, both in abundance and, and, and in diversity. Uh, and I put that down to it's not just the fact that there is water. It's the range of water they've got. You know, they've, they've got... Uh, uh, water with a lot of woody debris. They've got uh, open water. They've got water which is fast flowing between the dams. There's very slow water with deep sediment. Uh, there's shallow water. There's deep water. There's, there's just whole whole range of, of niches uh, available. Um, and when we think about dragonfly fly prey, uh, we've got all the stuff which is living in and around the water, but then we've also got all the stuff which is living on uh, deadwood. And, and that's, I guess, one of the one of the big bonuses with, with beavers is you do get a lot of deadwood habitat. And um, that is something in our context, which mm -hmm. is really quite hard to um, uh, see these days at deadwood. You know, uh, uh, Britain is a, is a tiny and very densely populated country and an awful lot of people like keeping it neat and tidy. And that means if there's any dead wood around, if there's any dead trees, they get cleared up. Um, and of course, within a beaver site, they're creating deadwood all the time, and uh, we're just leaving them to it. And, and that has made a big difference as well, I think. So before we talk about actual reintroduction, um, I have another question about about biodiversity. Or what, what about fish? Okay, um, uh, our, our stream was very small. Maybe um, uh, typically in the summer, or um, one or two inches deep. Uh, and maybe three feet wide at the widest point. Um, uh, and it would hold fish, but very, very small fish. You know, we would have trout fry and you would occasionally find if there's a little pool somewhere uh, or, or, or a hollow under a tree or something, you might find uh, an adult trout in there, but they would be incredibly small. You know, you could have an adult trout that's only four to five inches long. Uh, now it, bigger pools here we are seeing trout which are um, maybe eight or ten inches long um, uh, this is only three years since the the, the beavers came back uh, we're seeing uh, otters uh, in our camera traps foraging here a lot and and of course a, a, a really a really good indication of uh, um, biodiversity is the density of predators uh, or, or the frequency of predator visits because the, predators, the, you know, the, the otters won't waste their time coming here if there's nothing for them to eat. Um, so that's a really, really good indicator that, that there's a lot going on. Um, 
and uh, I, I, uh, I am told by some in the angling community that um, beaver dams will be a an impediment, a barrier to movement of migratory fish. And we do get a migratory species here, an analogue of your of your um, um, steelhead trout. Uh, if that's your, is that your migratory trout? Well, there's steelhead and then there's also, of course, salmon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We, we don't, we don't get salmon, um, this far up. It's just too, too small, but we certainly get, um, sea trout, which is, a a, a, a um, uh, an analog to your steelhead. Uh, and they come right up to our system. I, I have caught them in winter before, uh, when the river is in spate. Uh, and, you know, the, the sea isn't very far from us. It's maybe five miles from us uh, uh, at a maximum. And um, the, these fish, can they can get up from the tide water up to our sort of spawning grounds, if you like, in pretty short order uh, when when the river's in, in spate. So they, they will come up. Uh, and each of our beaver dams actually has a very creditable fish ladder associated with it because the water's got to go somewhere. It can't all... Uh, just be kept back. So each beaver dam comes with a, a, a little side stream where the water goes around the side, uh, which has got uh, a sufficiently low gradient that fish find it very, very simple to, to uh, swim up and down. Um, if they're too lazy to jump over, uh, and I don't discount that some fish may be too lazy to jump over a dam, so uh, that they, they just swim around the side. Um, and I, I, I see, you know, when people say, these are a barrier to migration. I, I just, I, I shake my head. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I, th- I think that that's kind of nonsense because there were beavers all over the Americas with all sorts of anadromous fish, and as you said, they either went around or went over, or sometimes they go through too. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I saw a wonderful piece of film. I think from uh, an American site. Um, I don't know which species of salmon it was, but. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, a place where there's a, a beaver dam and a stream and a gradually growing number of of uh, salmon building up against the, uh, the downstream side of the dam and eventually almost by sheer weight of numbers they overcome the dam um, uh, absolutely extraordinary to see uh, and uh, just illustrates that um, you know what we think about nature sometimes probably is wrong. So let's talk, thank you for that. Let's talk about the, um, the history of reintroduction. When was the first beaver reintroduced to Britain? And, um, and eventually I want to talk about your own place, but let's, let's talk about the history of reintroduction in general first. When did it happen? Uh, how did it happen? And what was the opposition and how was the opposition, um, how did the, how did the reintroduction take place despite the opposition? Okay, well, th- there were um, uh, attempts at uh, reintroduction going back to the uh, 1960s, uh, and they were attempts by uh, government agencies or, or by individuals within government agencies, and actually each one, each attempt was uh, crushed by uh, the agencies themselves. Um, and I guess it's a typical story of... Uh, large institutions being very, very um, risk averse, being very uh, unwilling mm-hmm. to create changes and, and so on. So we had um, uh, a, a number of a number of efforts and some really good reports written um, uh, by uh, I- interested parties going back to then. And then uh, this, this gradually, gradually uh, uh, came back to the fore again during the 1990s. Um, when uh, the movement towards rewilding, I don't know if rewilding is a thing per se in, in, in uh, your part of the world, but it, it is quite a, a big idea in, in Europe now. Um, and uh, uh, lot, lots of effort was put into working out what things we should be re- reintroducing to, to uh, Britain. And of course, uh, things like wolves and bears and lynx and uh, and wild cattle and this kind of thing, they, they get a lot of airplay because they're big and they're dangerous and they're sexy. Um, but a few people were talking about beavers again, and and it it gradually uh, um, mm-hmm. became more and more 
obvious that this is something that, that was doable because they they can be confined fairly easily. If one doesn't, if one did escape, it's unlikely to kill your child or eat your pets. Uh, and so it, it, this this um, this species has become a bit of a poster child for rewilding here. And it is like uh, if I talk in terms of um, drug addiction, it's the gateway rewilding uh, uh, animal, um, as I say, because it, it's relatively controllable. It's relatively friendly. It's very cute. Um, and, and um, uh, you know, if it does escape, they're quite easy to catch in this coming. So, so we're on to we're on to a real winner there. And I believe the very first ones uh, reintroduced uh, were to a site in Kent in 2002, uh, I believe. And uh, they were uh, a couple of pairs that were put into a large site, uh, which was basically um, a wetland site that was drying out. Uh, for all the typical uh, reasons that, that uh, wetlands do dry out if they're not, if they don't have the, the, the right wildlife in there to keep them wet. And the beavers went in there and they did a fabulous job. Uh, and gradually they escaped from there as well and they began to inhabit uh, a nearby river. So uh, Kent now has a population of, of probably two or three hundred beavers living in a stream there, um, not causing very much harm to anyone. And actually proven to be quite um, popular with most of the adjacent landowners and, and population as well. So that was a start. And that was followed uh, fairly soon after um, by uh, Scotland um, uh, unofficially, where some beavers escaped from a private collection uh, into a major watercourse and slowly colonised that. And then the Scottish government uh actually stuck its neck out and reintroduced beavers into a remote area of the country um and there's now quite a creditable uh population of beavers living there although it's in a place where the beavers will find it very very hard to migrate far from to inhabit other parts of the country so so that they were very careful to make sure that it couldn't spread the ones uh, elsewhere in scotland are spreading quite fast now and there are uh, at least several hundred of them li living there, um, uh, causing havoc with certain uh, land uses in certain places. But um, uh, despite that, they are really coming along fast. Uh, in England, uh, we've had beavers and in Wales, we've had beavers in uh, enclosures in a few places since around about the late noughties, so around about 2008, eight nine. Um, they first went in um, and they have also been escaping them from those same places uh, uh, slowly as well. So we now have uh, wild beavers living on uh, a river on the Devon Cornwall border, uh, perhaps as many as 100. Uh, that, that, is, that is sheer guesswork on my part. We're doing some survey work later this year to try and establish that. Uh, a place called the River Otter where uh, a very well-studied population exists uh, on the River Wye, where there's a small population that extends into uh, from England into Wales, uh, and a, uh, a small population living on the River Avon, uh, and then um, I believe a very small population living in, in the southern edge of the Cotswold Hills. So there are there are several. Um, uh, unofficial wild um, uh, beaver populations now, all quite small, but uh, but looking more and more settled as the years go by. And uh, we've probably got something like a dozen plus uh, enclosed uh, beavers, I be beavers in, in, in big enclosures um, in a variety of places as well. So. And that's the length of the uh, and breadth of the country. That's from, from right in the south here with me, right up to the very north next to Scotland. And we think that all things being equal, that this this um, this general motion will continue uh, to uh, acquire more and more beavers and get them into more and more habitat as time goes by. I can't tell you how happy that all makes me. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, I'm quite pleased too. <laughs> uh, it, it, is, it is making a, um, uh, it, admittedly, in very, very local places, it's, it is beginning to make a difference. So where, where, where did the first beavers come from that were reintroduced? The very first ones, I believe, came from Norway. Uh, and um, then after Norway, we started to get them in. Uh, we had a very small number come from Poland and then uh, from Bavaria. And there's a wonderful man called Gerhard Schwab, uh, uh, based in Bavaria, who is uh, kind of the beaver manager for Bavaria. Uh, and um, he has been instrumental in uh, capturing problem beavers there and using them to establish uh, new populations in different countries. I mean, um, in around about the turn of the 19th century, 20th century, we had probably about a thousand beavers, European beavers left in a little population in Norway, a little one in the south of France, a little one in Germany, uh, and a rather bigger one in uh, Belarus stroke uh, Russia. And uh, those those thousand animals are now something like a million and a half. Uh, and Gerhard Schwab has been personally responsible for a great deal of the expansion into new countries. So that I believe we've got beavers now in 26 or 27 European countries, uh, which is just fabulous. That's great. That's great. So can you tell me... <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you sort of walk us through the the process on your land of <clears throat> excuse me, like okay, so I have a friend who has has rescued some prairie dogs who were going to be killed to put in a uh a shopping mall and she volunteered her land and when you when you introduce prairie dogs to her area, reintroduce, then you have to make them uh, you have to first dig a hole and put in a little box and then get a tube from it so they have a place to stay until they're able to dig yeah. their own holes. So yeah. so can you walk us through uh, your or any reintroduction, you know, sort of a, a, a three or four or five minute version of, of how of the actual process? OK, okay. Um, well, first of all, I'll, I'll quickly mention the motivation here. Um I was aware that there were beavers in, in Britain. I was also aware that there were wild beavers living in Britain where they shouldn't be. Uh, <clears throat> but very, very aware that they were hardly noticed by the people, if you like. You had to really know what you're doing to, to go and find a beaver somewhere. And that's one of their most wonderful things is they can live below the radar really, really happily for quite a long time until the numbers get to be so high they start to make a nuisance of themselves. Um, and uh, we had flooding in our local village, uh, two year, uh, sorry, tw twice running in the space of a month. Uh, and we all know uh, er everything about climate change and the instability that's coming with that. And it struck me that we should be looking to hold, you know, as, as a landowner, we should be looking to make our land hold more water for longer when we have periods of high rainfall. And um, uh, we could have done that using a whole load of man-made efforts, uh, you know, kind of beaver dam analogs and uh, work with a, a, a digger and so on to create ponds and this sort of thing. Um, but it would have cost money and there was no budget from anywhere to do that with. And, and I thought, well, why don't we get beavers to do it for free? Uh, and um, that, that set us off on the route. And to begin with, I naively thought we'd just get two or three pairs of beavers and let them go, just let them go in the river and, and, and we'd just sit back and watch. And indeed, that would have worked, uh, although we couldn't tell where they'd settled, but th th that would have more or less worked. Um, but that would have been against the law, we then found. So we were able at that point to uh, keep them inside an enclosure without having to have a license for them. So we built an enclosure and we got a pair of beavers and we put them in there. Now, um, what we had to do was to have a fence that was... Uh, uh, came up to a, a, a specification um, which is accepted by our wildlife agency, which is called Natural England. Um, and we had to um, uh, source the beavers from uh, from a captive source. So 
uh, we could assume that they were coming with a fairly clean bill of health. Um, uh, our site already had, had a pond in it because we had dug a pond there, um, oh gosh, about uh, 25, 30 years ago, uh, 35 years ago, in fact, when I think about it, which um, was uh, designed to act as a as a, re- a reserve of water if we had a really bad drought, because we, occasionally we do get a pretty pretty severe drought. Um, and so we had a ready-made made place for them to go into. It was in a patch of um, uh, wet riverine woodland with a lot of species they, they like, particularly willow. Um, and so the, there was a ready-made place for them to go. Uh, some people said we should build a lodge for them. Um, but when I read about it, just about every uh, example of a lodge being uh, uh, built for the beavers didn't result in the beavers using it. They, they quite often go and have a look, sniff at it, maybe go inside, come out, and then don't go near it again. Uh, that's the that's typical thing. So I thought, why, why, why bother to waste time and effort building a lodge on that? They'll, they'll figure it out. And indeed, they did figure it out very quickly. Um, and... Uh, I mean, that's it. That's it, really. Uh, 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 it, it, there's, there's no great, no great science to it. I do know people have spent a lot of time trying to do things to make the beavers feel more at home. I, I think, I think the beavers are incredibly adaptable, and if they have, if they have uh, water and food, uh, and, and critically enough water to be able to actually swim around in, um, they're pretty happy, um, uh, and that they'll, they'll settle down. So this might be a silly question, but where did they sleep before they built their before they built when you put them in there? Where did they sleep before they built their own home? OK, um, uh, the um, the place where our pond was had quite a lot of overhanging vegetation. Uh, we've got a plant here called gorse. I don't know if you have it in the States. Uh, it's a, it's Ulex is the generic name for it. It's, it's a very thorny, dense evergreen plant. Uh, shrub, if you like, and um, there were some stands of that around the edge of the pond. They create uh, a, a, a lot of cover uh, and a deep shade, and they were just sitting on a ledge. I found them, actually, after a while. They were sitting on a ledge during the daylight hours uh, underneath uh, a gorse cover, and I knew they were there. Uh, beavers are very capable of pretending that no one knows they're there, even when they do. Uh, and, and so unless you go and poke them with the stuck or something, they'll just sit there quietly and, and wait for you to go. Um, and later on, after they'd actually built their first lodge, there were times when in the summer when it was hot weather, they would still sit out in the day on the bank in a place where there's lots of cover. Uh, and, and just now and again, you'd realize that there was something that they, they, they were out about during the daytime because you'd, you'd see see little signs of them and, and, uh, and realize that's that's what was going on. So I, I, I suspect that's quite a natural behaviour. Um, and as long as they've got deep water nearby, they can get in too fast. I think they're, they're fairly, fairly comfortable. Um, and I, I, I expect you've seen a beaver, if it gets disturbed on land, they can get into water really, really quick. So how many years have they been on your land? Uh, just over three and a half years now. And have they and have they raised generations? They have, um, and this is this is where uh, the uh, the advisability or the limitations of, of, of enclosures cut, come uh, to force. You know, the, the fencing is incredibly expensive, uh, and although we have a, 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 an enclosure which is big enough to physically support a family of beavers. Uh, it's probably not physically big enough to support their social behavior, uh, such that uh, in their third year, uh, uh, this, this year gone, in, in the summer of 2019, I found a dead beaver uh, within the site, and it was a, a female two-year-old, so one of their firstborn they had killed. Uh, 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 one of the parents had killed it. I don't know why. Um, although typically in, in a wild situation, when they reach that age, they will disperse. I, I was 
uh, uh, naive uh, about that. I thought uh, they'd be unlikely to kill one of their own relatives, but um, absolutely they, they, they had. Um, and funnily enough, later this in the year, in about October or so, I found a second dead beaver, but that was a, a youngster. That was just uh, five or six months old. And uh, there were no, there was no damage on that one. Um, and it was still in good condition. So I've got that in the deep freeze to wait to, to, to get to a, a vet for a post-mortem. But um, uh, I, I think something else happened. That there, there, was, there was no sign of any foul play, let's say. So what I have to do coming up now this year is that the animals which were born in 2020, I'm going to catch them when they're about 18 mm-hmm. months old, before they get into that danger zone with their parents, but when they're, when they're quite big, and, and will be able to more or less um, uh, fend for themselves in, in, a, in a new location. <clears throat> so we have about um, <clears throat> we have about I don't know five or six minutes left, and I have really a couple questions left. One of them yep. is: Can you talk a little bit about uh, Beaver Trust and uh, what you do and what people can do to support it? And then the other question is. Can you sort of end the interview by uh, you mentioned rewilding and can you can you uh, can you end the interview by making the larger call and the larger connection between beavers and the larger rewilding of other. You said this is a gateway. Can you can you walk us through that gateway to end the interview? I'll I'll do my best. (laughs) Uh, You've got to remember I'm a livestock farmer as well. And um, uh, there are some parts of the whole rewilding thing which I don't necessarily um, uh, ag- agree with in, in great detail. It's like everything. There's a spectrum of there's a spectrum of people from from on the one hand uh, who would like to clear people out of big areas and just reintroduce uh, l- large herbivores and big carnivores and let them let them uh, just just take the place over. Uh, and and I agree that has got a certain attraction to it, but. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not really looking forward to it happening right here. Now, um, uh, the Beaver Trust came about. Uh, I, I met um, a couple of guys uh, in March of 2019 who were really interested in the idea of uh, getting into um, improving the wildlife on uh, British farmland. And I, I was wholeheartedly approving of that. Um, but I thought that the best thing we could do, rather than be looking at the whole spectrum of, uh, of farmland, look for where the opportunity really is and where we can do something really meaningful. And uh, it stri- strikes me and it has struck me for a long time now that we cannot grow potatoes in a river. We can't grow bushels of wheat in a river. Uh, and there's very often... Uh, immediately adjacent to the river, uh, a kind of a, uh, a buffer of land, which is not necessarily the best land for farming anyway. So there is an opportunity of land which runs systemically through our country, uh, um, a, a network which goes more or less everywhere, where there is land available uh, for uh, a, a degree of, uh, of rewilding, a, de- a degree of what I call the restoration of ecological function, because y- y- I've got to be careful I don't start swearing here because I get quite uh, quite quite wound up about this. Um, uh, th- there is this this uh, uh, this zone, if you like, and let's say for the sake of argument, it's a zone that's 20 meters either side or, 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 of any river, uh, where frankly farming isn't going to be giving up very much. And that sort of thing can be covered by uh, things like uh, conservation covenants and that kind of thing to compensate the landowner, if you like, for losing control of that bit of land uh, and start to leave natural processes mm-hmm. to, 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 uh, to, to restore. And um, the biggest agent going for that, uh, uh, producing the, the kind of results we want, is the beaver. Uh, it's gradually, gradually sinking in everywhere from uh, um, government ministers uh, right down to uh, school children that this animal is incredibly good. So um, the, the three of us and one or two others 
uh, we began to look at this idea of raising some money to begin to really fight for and campaign for the beavers uh, in a big way. We already had one or two people who were physically reintroducing them, but there was no one making a big a big noise about beavers, and no no, no one was um, get, getting getting uh, 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 their face on the TV and saying, you know, we need this animal now. No one was going out there uh, and meeting people in in the community halls and uh, and telling them about beavers and what they could do for them. No one was going to see people who got flooded and and said, look, you know, we could help to fix this um, and we could do it really cheaply if we can bring this animal back. You know, um, one of the most amazing statistics is we spend nearly a billion pounds a year in this little country on flood defence. To bring back beavers would cost one half of one percent of that to get them back across this country and provide a man in every county to be the, the local beaver manager. So where there are problems, he can go and sort them out. You know, this this is pocket change. You know, for a government department to have a, a shortfall or an overspend of half percent in a year is nothing. This 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 is this is pocket change, mm -hmm. um, and we just took it uh, uh, on ourselves to really really work at making this bloody thing happen. And, and we've we've got a, a wonderful a, a wonderful uh, uh, gang of fellow travellers now. Um, uh, everything uh, uh, from um, uh, ordinary housewives, if you like, and and uh, farmers and landowners and students and uh, just ac across the piece. Um, and uh, we have been doing a lot on the media. Uh, we seem to get into the media uh, almost almost weekly, it seems. Um, and in fact, I've got the BBC coming to camp here for two weeks uh, later this month uh, to be filming beavers in winter and see what they do, do in, in the wintertime. Um, so that's why we formed the Beaver Trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, we've um, we've been uh, fundraising. Um, yeah, all, 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 all the all the money that we have to put into this is basically a private donation. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, it'd be fantastic if the government decided, yes, we're going to bring beavers back and we're going to fund the beaver trust to do it. That would just be marvellous. But um, I don't think we're there yet. We're, the government, although they're making promising noises about policy and so on, they are not yet in the posi position of owning the, the programme. And I do think, in the end, uh, it is unrealistic to depend on private enterprise and NGOs to to do this. You know, this this is a this is a national project, and and I think to a degree there has to be some national uh, buy-in. And um, it could just be that they create a policy and then provide this minimum amount of funding uh, uh, to the NGOs to make it happen. But um, there's got to be some kind of buy-in. Uh, is is my view. And uh, you can if you look at our website. Uh, which is www.beavertrust.org. Um, you can get in there. We've got uh, quite a lot of friends and uh, uh, fellow travellers in the USA. Um, I'll mention Heidi Perryman, for example, and Emily Fairfax, uh, uh, are both resident in California, uh, uh, amongst many, many others. Um, and um, uh, there is, if, if anyone was moved to do so, there is a, there is a, a page uh uh, or a, a button on our front page which allows you to donate through the website if, if anyone would like to do that. But um, more importantly, uh, uh, from my point of view, is talk to us and talk to other people about it. Uh, if you've got any connection with, with England or Great Britain at all, that, that is, a, is a really wonderful, powerful thing. Um, your other question, if I've still got any time left, uh, about uh, uh, the gateway to rewilding, I can see... That going forward, you know, uh, um, times are changing and um, there are quite large parts of our country. Uh, uh, as I understand it, you know, we've, we've got uh, um, uh, national parks here which are more or less the same size as Yellowstone, um, which could have a lot more uh, wildlife uh, in them. Um, and I can see that. Gradually, it's very, very slow because, uh, you know, trying to trying to turn a democracy around or change, change a democracy is a long, slow process. And um, I hope I haven't touched any raw nerves there with your current situation. Um, 
uh, we we have uh, uh, you know we we have a really big job to do, and I, I do think you know we, we're a developed country, so how can we go to uh, to um, let's say uh, Africa and slate people for wiping out their wildlife? When we've done ours 2,000 years ago uh, and we're not prepared to change our ways, I think we have to. Even on a limited scale, I think we have to. So the, the, the beaver, if you like, is a, is a totem for this. It's a way we can show we can bring um, wildlife back to the country, uh, that the world isn't going to end because we bring uh, a, a new species or, or an old species back to life here again. We can already see over and over, even though we've got relatively small numbers, um, but all the places they are, wildlife is booming. And I, I often say to people, you know, if 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 nature isn't thriving, then then how can we thrive? And I I, I think there's a very very deep connection on a whole range of levels uh, between us and our environment. It has to be that way. You know, it can't be any other way. We are, we are essentially the, 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 the sum of our environment. And as our environment has been eroded, I think uh, the sum of us has been eroded too in a whole host of ways. And we need to be turning that clock back. And um, I've been lucky enough to be in the States uh, and uh, been in places like Yellowstone and uh, just been blown away by the magnificence of the, of the, of the wildlife there and the spectacle. Uh, and the, the abundance uh, of, uh, of uh, fauna and flora there. So we need to be doing that here in this country. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we, we cannot be an exception. Well, thank you so much for all of that. And um, thank you for your work in the world. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Chris Jones. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs> Mm-hmm.